that's my hope for us this morning, is that we, the church, would lead the way in God's heart for justice. The world has all kinds of things to say about justice, and they're running in so many different directions because they do not have the right filter. And so there are all kinds of discussions taking place today, but all of them fall short. All of them advance man's idea of justice instead of God's heart for justice. This is our manual for doing justice. It's a gospel-centered justice. And I want to talk this morning from a famous parable. So if you have your Bible, I hope that you'll join me in turning to Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25 through uh, 37. As you're turning there, um, I grew up in the church. And when I say that, I mean I literally grew up in the church. So I'm the son of a Baptist pastor, and we grew up in a parsonage next door to the church. And Sunday school was held in the parsonage, so on the first floor of our house. I could never understand why I could not go to Sunday school in my very cool Superman pajamas, because uh, it's just downstairs. Instead, back in those days, we had to get dressed up. I had to actually wear a suit uh, to go down to the first floor uh, of my house. And we'd have Sunday school. So I love the uh, children's pastor earlier today that we talked about, the, the children's leader, director. Uh, and that's, I remember Sunday school. Now, some of you are old enough to remember this with me because nowadays I'm sure that you probably have these cool touchscreen monitors to uh, describe Sunday school lessons. But we had a big felt board. Do you remember the big felt board? Uh-huh, with the little felt figures that they would stick on there. And I remember this story. This story was a famous one because there'd be the Samaritan. Here, this is the good Samaritan. And there'd be all of these other figures, but there was somebody missing. And I'm gonna come back to that to see as we read the story, this person was never on the felt panel. And I think that's terrible today. So I'll leave you hanging there. As we read God's word, I think it's probably your tradition as it is with my evangelical free church to uh, stand and read God's word uh, because it's so important to give him honor. So if you would mind standing, uh, let's read from Luke 25. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, will you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive your message this day that we might respond and that we might live differently in a world that desperately needs your gospel justice. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I titled, I titled my book on purpose, Gospel Justice, that Moody published and they put together the video uh, be, as 
an opposite to a social justice movement. It's not that justice isn't social, I wanna be careful, but it's become so politicized and the gospel must lead first. And you might wonder, like the Good Samaritan story, because it is that kind of flannel felt board, Sunday school lesson, feel good lesson, what that has to do with the gospel and justice. Well, it has to do with where I left you kind of hanging, right? When I was a kid, I remember the Samaritan on that flannel board. I remember even his donkey. I remember the injured man and the priest and the Levite. They were even rocks that those robbers, you know, hid behind and stuff. But there was somebody missing. And it really bothers me today. Because you know who was missing? The lawyer. <laughs> Come on, there was no lawyer. I mean, I'm a lawyer, you heard that, uh, plead guilty, but it, the lawyer is the main character. I mean, the lawyer is the one that asked the question and it's the lawyer that Jesus is telling the story to. And I love lawyers. Now that always gets a laugh too, just, just pay. But I, I do. The reason I like lawyers is because they're good thinkers and they ask good questions. Now, if you've ever been in a deposition or if you've ever been in a courtroom, you really do not like that. Uh, but they do ask good questions. And the lawyer here did not ask a good question. He asked the question. I mean, the number one question every single one of us must ask. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the question. And that's where the gospel enters into the story. You know, I don't know about you, but I grew up again in the church and I grew up on the Romans road, uh, path for salvation. And Paul hasn't written Romans yet, or nor has he written Ephesians. But if Jesus asked me that question today, I would say, what must you do to inherit eternal life? Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. I would go to Ephesians for by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast, right? I knew the answer, but that's not the answer Jesus gives. Now I wanna be careful. Jesus always gives the answer really in the upper room discourse. John 14, six, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father, but by me. So salvation is in Christ alone, uh, through faith alone, by grace alone, that's it. But Jesus here is showing that the gospel, a true understanding of the gospel is that once saved, you will live that out in love toward the vulnerable, toward those in need. And that's really what he's gonna tell the, uh, the lawyer here. But the lawyer does ask the right question. I think this lawyer hung out with other lawyers because that's what we do. We're, we're very tribal. We, we hang out with one another. Lawyers know lawyers. Uh, and there's another lawyer that asked Jesus uh, some of the same questions in the Gospel of Mark. They're having a debate around marriage and some other things because the lawyers of the day, they argued like they do today. They had 613 rules. That's what the Talmud had. And those rules they imposed through the uh, ruling council of the day. There were 70 ruling elders uh, that were part of the Sanhedrin, and they would debate the Sadducees, the Pharisees, you know, the characters of the New Testament and the scribes and the teachers of the law. And they would all debate these 613 rules. And there's another lawyer asking Jesus that, and it's Jesus who summarized the law in two, right? He, he boiled all of those 613 rules down to two. And most Jews would have agreed with the first one because it's the Shema, it's the, it's hear, O Lord, the Lord your God is one love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? That's something that they actually said every day. Uh, so, and they would wear it on their, those big boxes that they had on their head. Uh, and th so they would understand that. But Jesus adds, love your neighbor as yourself from Leviticus 19, not the go-to verses, even though they certainly knew the uh, first five books of the, the Bible and lived out of them. But it was Jesus who gave that answer. So love God completely, totally, totally surrendered, fully sold out to God, put him first, and then love your neighbor. And I think this lawyer was a good lawyer and he wanted to know, surely there's limits on that. 
Jesus. I mean, we debate over these 613 rules. You can't mean everybody when you say that, to love everyone. Someone who breaks those rules, I mean, you read in the New Testament, right? The man born blind, they want to kick you out of the assembly. They don't want you to be part of uh, the, uh, the in group. And then certainly there would be others outside of that. And I will tell you, chief among them would have been a Samaritan. There is no way that you could love that kind of person. So the lawyer wanted to justify himself. He wanted to know what limits there were on love. And Jesus basically says there are no limits on love as he tells him the story. And so then we get into the story, and it, it's a great uh, story because Jesus chooses two people who the lawyer would have really liked hanging out with. Uh, he would have loved the priest and the Levites. They were part of the in system. And so they are purposely good religious leaders, good religious people, but they miss a divine opportunity. Uh, and that's what Jesus's point is. And interestingly, the Samaritan would have been the absolute last person expected by this Jewish lawyer to be the one that stops. And we're going to see what happens as a result of that. Uh, but uh, this morning, I, as I talk about each of these characters, it is helpful to just think through, Lord, you have me here for a reason this day, in this moment. I'm sitting at home, I'm watching this, or I'm uh, a part of one of the services here in the building, and you have me here for a purpose. What is it? What is it if I'm really going to search my heart today? Am I a priest? Am I a Levite? Or am I a Samaritan? To answer that, let's look at each of them. And first of all, we need to know why it matters. It matters not to the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. Really, this is all about an injured man. That's what Jesus starts the story with, because there's a man who's traveling from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho on the way of blood is what it was called, the Jericho Road. Uh, it's a very dangerous winding path. I've been to Israel several times. I've been on this winding path, and it was very dangerous. Robbers would beset people, and so this poor man is beset upon. And this is a lesson on justice and injustice because they could have just robbed him, but instead they beat him, they stripped him, and they left him for dead. It, it was robbing him of complete dignity, taking even his clothes, let alone everything else, and beating him, which wasn't necessary to rob. And that, friends, is what we see all the time today. People are beat. One of the most horrific things happening because of this pandemic is the increase in domestic violence and the increase in child abuse because children are not in schools, it's not being identified, and we see an increase, we've seen a significant increase all across the country where I serve uh, in violence, literal violence. We see increases in abuses of people oppressing and taking advantage through unfair lending practices, through uh, just uh, the eviction moratoriums, and there's lots of challenges in that, but people still looking to evict people, uh, and then other challenges that happen because people are alone. A lot of senior citizens getting taken advantage of. They're at home. They're believing scams that target them and seek to take advantage of them. It's an oppressiveness that happens all across this country. And the tragedy is that in the United States of America, where we pledge liberty and justice for all, we rank, you heard in, the, in 2010 last, but it, in the most recent one last year, we rank 110 out of 128 countries in the world for providing affordable access to justice. The reality is one in three Americans simply cannot afford the incredible high cost of lawyers. That means that every second in the United States of America, someone gets turned away from legal help because they can't find it. More than 40 million every year in this country. And that is just tragic. Uh, and it just should not be. In the United States, that should not be. In the kingdom of God, whose very foundation is justice and righteousness, that must not be. We must be people who care about justice and righteousness, both, never separating one from the other, but care about them deeply. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell this lawyer. And so uh, this neighbor who is victimized, 
who feels vulnerable, exposed. He's laying on the road, and a priest comes along. Imagine you see this person coming. It's going to be okay. It's a priest. But the priest sees you. Jesus makes a point to say that he saw the man, and he walked on by. Think about how the neighbor felt. And friends, I think that there are neighbors literally right around us here who need help and the church walks past them. And think about how they feel when that happens. When a place that should be the place that stops, that should be the place that's leading, is the place that walks on by. Now why? In the book I postulate that maybe the priest was just busy. You know, priests in the day would take a 14-week rotation, they would go down to, they would go to Jerusalem, they would serve, and then they would go home, and they served in these rotations. Uh, you can read that in Luke 1, Zechariah, John the Baptist father, he's during, doing one of these tours of duty when uh, he encounters uh, the angel telling him the, about John the Baptist and loses his voice. He was part of that rotation. So the priest has been gone for a while. So maybe he's just busy and he is looking forward to going home, spending time with his wife, his kids. What's wrong with that? You know, we live in such a busy world that we become disconnected from one another. If COVID has done one thing, maybe it's helped us see that our need for other people, that isolation is terrible and that it causes all kinds of collateral issues from depression to uh, just just an unnaturalness. We know that we were created for community and when community gets separated, it just doesn't work. So the priest may have just been looking, longing for that community and and heading home and just saw but didn't really see. You ever been a part of that? Like you're in a conversation? Uh, hey, it's the Super Bowl today, right? So wives, when you're talking to your husbands, be careful, make sure it's during uh, some other time because you can talk to them, they can hear you, but they, it doesn't register at all, right? It's like they're in a different world. Uh, and I know this, I learned this really well when my twin sons, I, I'm blessed with twin sons, Joseph and Daniel, they're adults now, but when they were little, uh, my wife raising twins is, whew, I agree with the, the uh, your director of children who said two is much harder than a whole group. Uh, and twins are double the trouble. Uh, and my wife left me alone with our, our sons when they were like two years old. And it might've been the first time she even did that. And uh, they, were, they were in their room and I thought, hey, great, they're, they're playing, they're, they're quiet. And besides that, how much trouble can two-year-olds get into? Yeah. And, then, and then I thought, they're nice and quiet. I'm downstairs and I'm watching a game. Yes, I'm watching the Bears. They're, they probably are losing. But uh, I, I'm watching the Bears and I just figure hey, it's a good thing that they're quiet. Now, any parent here knows that's really not a good thing. Uh, and twins, boy, are they good. They work together to do the most evil things. If you ever want a definition of original sin, hang out with a two-year-old, right? Uh, and so one of my sons, they work together, gets on the back of another son, lifts so that he can reach a globe. It's a Noah's Ark uh, snow globe uh, that they couldn't have reached otherwise, but together they figured out how to get it. But of course it falls and it breaks, it's glass. Now, my one son, you can look, he still has the scar today. He grabs it and just cuts himself badly. So blood spurting everywhere. My other son thinks that's pretty cool. And he takes his brother's hand and paints all over the wall. Yeah, of course, timing wise, it was perfect because that's when my wife comes home. I don't know anything going on. She goes, well, where are the kids? Upstairs, they're quiet in the room. She goes up there, there's blood all over the wall. Uh, my son's bleeding and, oh yeah, my, my, my wife is Puerto Rican. And yeah, she, uh, she went, she definitely went all Puerto Rican on me, uh, which is fine, that's exactly right. And uh, I swear I had to paint over because you can't wash out blood. And if you come to visit my house today with one of those special lights, you would swear somebody was murdered in our house. And I really almost was. So uh, that's, we, we have to be careful when we're paying att attention, right? We, uh, uh, like the priest, I missed the opportunity to do what my wife was asking me to do. Was it wrong that I was watching a football game? No. But 
in the moment, yes, I needed to have my sons with me. I needed to pay more attention. And we miss opportunities all the time. And that was Jesus' point with the priest. We miss divine opportunities to do, not that we're not doing bad things, but we miss the opportunity to do the best thing that he wants us to do. The very one thing that my wife asked me to do, I failed to do, and I should have done that. And that happens to us every day. I think that's the lesson of the priest. The lesson of the Levite might be a little different. You know, Levites uh, were very strict rule followers, and they knew the law. They were set apart. Remember, they didn't have their own allotment uh, of the 12 tribes. Uh, and honestly, when you read, they, they were really supposed to identify with the poor and vulnerable by not having an allotment of land and serve the priest in the Levitical system. Well, the Levite may have known, I mean, of course, because he knew all the rules, that, hey, what if this person dies? If I go near a dead person, now I'm excluded from the assembly. I can't worship. I can't, be, uh, I can't do what I need to do. So this person, I don't want to go near them. I don't want to touch them. Uh, and besides, they, they probably, this is probably God's judgment on them. There's a reason why this happened, and God may be judging him for something that I'm not aware of, or uh, God may have uh, allowed, he allowed this to happen, and it's probably something bad that the person did in their life, right? I just speculate. I don't know why the Levite, what I do know from Jesus' story is that the Levite also saw the injured man, and he failed to stop to serve the need that was present, and he walked on by. And I think today we can make that mistake. In a world that is so divided like it is right now, it is so easy to get into camps of people and to use labels for the other. And it is wrong whenever we do it. I don't care what the label is, whether it's a racial label, whether it's a religious label, whether it's a political label, God only has one label, and it's the Imago Deo. People are created in his image, and that's the only label that matters. And God wants us to love all people. That's not to say that we don't shed truth when we reach out to them. That's the hope and the point of the gospel. But we love all neighbors in order to shine the light of the gospel, in order to share the hope of the gospel with people in need. And so the Levite really missed an opportunity, and he failed to understand fundamentally God's heart for justice. There was an injustice here, and the Levite, of all people, should have been the one entering into that space to bring God's justice. You know, justice in the Bible is, justice for the poor, is the second most prominent theme in Scripture, with thousands of verses uh, that are highlighted by the American Bible Society and the Poverty and Justice Bible. There are hundreds, literally, of just references to the two key Hebrew words for justice. They are mishpat and tzedek. And mishpat is all about fairness. In fact, a Jewish lawyer who was present is called a mishpatan. That's what they are called, based on mishpat, which is the justice word in Hebrew. It means to balance scales, but to balance them for the weak balance them for the vulnerable. So you'll see throughout the Old Testament, it's the widow, the fatherless, the immigrant, and the poor, right? You'll see those four referenced throughout uh, scripture. In the New Testament, Jesus will refer to them as the least of these. Uh, and uh, we'll still talk about the widow and the, the uh, fatherless, the orphan. And so the lawyer should have known that Mishpatan was all about a justice that's rooted in fairness, God's heart for fairness. Ascetic is all about restoring what is broken, righting what is wrong. It literally is the exact same word, same root as the word for righteousness. So the twin pillars of God's kingdom, justice and righteousness, are rooted in the exact same phrase. They, they are, in other words, they are literally inseparable. You cannot have justice without righteousness or righteousness without justice. They go together. Uh, and so that's why you find them so often together throughout scripture. And uh, Sedek is all about restoring. So first, restoring in relationship with God. That's loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You have to be restored first with God. Then it is about restoring you in relationship with others, loving your neighbor as yourself. And that's why Jesus brought these concepts together because they go together. We must be restored with God and with neighbor. And that literally is the word in Hebrew for justice. 
Uh, and then, uh, interestingly enough, too, the root for a generous justice that we see here in the Samaritan that we'll talk about, but the word for generosity in Hebrew is tzedakah. It's the exact same word with an A-H, and so at the end. So generosity, God's generous heart of justice that is seen best at the cross and in his sacrifice is generous sacrifice for those of us who do not deserve it. And then it's demonstrated when we do the same toward others who may not deserve it, but God asks us to demonstrate mercy and grace and love to that vulnerable neighbor who needs it. And that's the concept of justice that Jesus was trying to help the lawyer, the Mishpatan, actually understand as he tells the story. Well, then there's, uh, how does that get lived out, uh, I guess, in our world today? Uh, just a beautiful example of it. I love, years ago, God called me to start Administer Justice. You heard in the introduction, it, it is now the largest, actually, legal ministry for the poor and vulnerable across the United States of America. We're in over 100 churches, coast to coast, who regularly have lawyers and teams of volunteers who are trained to serve their neighbors who have legal issues. So over COVID, this last year, one of our centers in the city of Chicago, uh, we had a an older grandma uh, you know, in a lot of places, she was an African-American woman. They're raising their grandchildren. And so she's raising a grandchild who's six years old. He's autistic. Uh, and uh, mom just had serious drug problems. Dad was never in the picture and was in jail. So grandma, as often as the case, is raising the child. She's doing a wonderful job. But she lives in an apartment, low-income area, and she's served with an eviction notice. She served with an eviction notice simply because a drug dealer was seen in the area. This grandma had nothing to do with it. She could prove that she wasn't anywhere near the area, but simply because this person was in the area under Section 8 housing, you can evict somebody, and they wanted to gentrify and turn these into, this was a big, big company that owned, and wanted to turn everything into condominiums. So they literally served eviction notices on everybody in the entire building. Uh, what was she going to do? She's terrified in COVID that she and her six-year-old autistic grandchild are going to be on the street. She learns of a gospel justice center at a church where she can go to get legal help. And she walked into that center on a Saturday morning. And friends, she never, ever would have stepped foot inside a church on a Sunday to meet with a pastor. But she stepped inside the, the foot in that church on Saturday to meet with a lawyer. And as she did, she's just greeted by a warm team, hospitality, um, all of these things. Uh, and she's just moved by the compassion that people have for her. She gets to meet with a lawyer who sees what's going on, knows this is crazy, and she just needs an advocate. She just needs somebody to call and cut through the clutter that will actually listen to, because they won't listen to the grandma, but they'll listen to the lawyer. Uh, and that's literally what the lawyer ends up doing and the case gets dismissed. But after meeting with the lawyer and having this weight removed that, oh, I'm not gonna be homeless with my six-year-old autistic grandson. Now she meets with somebody we call a client advocate who purposefully demonstrates every single one of our clients get this uh, little booklet called Good News About Justice on how can God allow injustice to happen? How does these things happen? Uh, and it's a plan of salvation, and every single client receives it across the country. There are thousands of them every year. Uh, and uh, our client advocates take the opportunity to ask if they can pray with someone, to ask if they understand their next steps, what they're going to do, because we empower people. Uh, we don't do for them. We do with them. And we empower them to take the next steps on their own. Sometimes that's us calling, but there's always something we ask of them so that they have something along the process. And our advocate's asking, going through those things, and she asks if she knows Jesus. And the woman just breaks down crying because she doesn't, and she just, she just knows that she needs Jesus in her life. And so that morning, she prayed to accept Jesus Christ as her Savior, and that next day, she was in church for the first time in her life as a grandma with her autistic grandson. And they're now worshiping uh, uh, regularly at that church in the city. And it happened because a lawyer was willing to stop and a team of people willing to serve someone who had needs in the community. 
And that's gospel justice in practical application. And we get to see it multiplied every year, coast to coast. Uh, and it's just, it's truly a joy and a privilege. And that's the privilege that really the Levite missed, being able to help his injured Jewish neighbor. It's an opportunity that the Samaritan took. You know, the Samaritan could have been really weary. He's in Jewish territory. Remember, the Jews walked all around Samaria. They didn't want to have anything to do with Samaria. And this Samaritan, with his donkey traveling, is probably a, a, a merchant uh, going through, risking going through this territory, selling wares. It would have been easy to say, wow, I don't want to stop. What if this happened to me? Uh, or if I stop, this person may not even appreciate it because we hate each other so much. But the Samaritan was willing to stop anyway. And he took what he had and he used it to serve. And that's a huge lesson too, because no one does justice alone. And it takes all of us. I just described for you this team that serves on a Saturday morning. And no matter what type of ministry, think of the church. The church is not one individual. It's a body working together with different gifts to serve. And each of you have something, and God asks you to use your something to further him. You don't have to be a lawyer. Uh, in fact, we have nine team members that serve on our teams coast to coast, and one of those is a lawyer. Eight are not lawyers because it takes so many other people to support and serve through prayer, hospitality, uh, meeting and praying with the client who's this advocate, interpreters, all of these different individuals working together. That's what it takes. Uh, it takes several people representing the body of Christ to be able to restore a vulnerable neighbor. That's what the Samaritan was willing to do because the Samaritan was also willing to take time. Hey, he had some place to go, but he made sure to take the injured man to an inn. And not only that, but take two days wages. I mean, denarii is a day's wage. So he takes two days wages and pays it and says, if you need more, I will pay more upon my return. And upon my return, I'm gonna make sure I actually follow up and make sure that this person is restored, that he's okay. And that's, it's just a beautiful demonstration of what Christ is calling us to do, to come alongside, to invest in the lives of vulnerable neighbors, to take them to a place where they can be fully restored. In that day, it was an inn, right? They would have had lots of uh, uh, things available. Today, I say the inn is the church. There is no other institution on earth that's called to be Christ's bride. And it is the church that should always lead the way in these areas. It's not government, it's not other things. It is the church of Jesus Christ. And the place wounded neighbors need to come is the church. They need to come here so they can be discipled, restored, and then honestly go forward and pay it forward. Then become people who serve and help other people. That was always God's multiplication plan through his church to reach people in need. And that's what the Samaritan did. He stopped and he served. Now, friends, I would love to tell you, I remember I told you earlier, I'm a preacher's kid. I grew up in the church, came to faith in Christ when I was seven years old at the foot of my father's bed um, and know that I was saved in that moment. But I equally know that I did not fully surrender to Christ until I was 35 years old because from age seven to then, I was concerned about building my kingdom. Uh, I went to Judson University that you may know, a good Christian school, went down to the University of Illinois for law school, came out, worked for a large firm, uh, did very well, knew that I could make more money though if I went out on my own. So two years after being a lawyer, I, I formed my own law practice, built many locations, lots of lawyers, did argue cases even before the United States Supreme Court, uh, was doing extremely well. By the time I'm in my 30s, I'm a multimillionaire. I'm doing very well. And I was just all about building my kingdom, building more and more law offices, doing bigger and, and better things. But God intervened and just said, no, I don't want you to build your kingdom. I want you to build my kingdom. And my kingdom is 
concerned about justice and righteousness for the poor and vulnerable. And I wouldn't have honestly ever started Administer Justice 21 years ago. I would have gladly walked by. But God in my life sent all kinds of lawsuits and problems into my life. We were trying to buy different buildings, everything fell apart. We were suddenly sued for different things and it wasn't my fault, but I'm the first name on the letterhead, so I'm involved in all these suits and my Christian law firm, we're fighting like crazy. I'm trying to hire different people. It all falls apart. And I just realized that I was a man named Jonah, that I was literally running from God and God sent a storm of circumstances to shake things up and say, no, I want you to go to Nineveh. In my case, I want you to go serve the poor and vulnerable. You, young man, have become a rich young ruler, and I want you to go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And I didn't want to do it. Like Jonah, I ran, but God turned up the heat, and I ultimately said, yes. I went and to my partners. They were not remotely happy uh, that the, the firm was being broken up. Uh, they thought I was crazy. Everybody else thought I was crazy. My twin sons had just been born uh, and my wife was staying home. That was easy for a senior partner of a successful law practice. It was very hard for a guy now who literally sold off the law practice, sold off his stocks, sold off his things so that he would have enough money to live on while he moved into the poor and served the poor, uh, which is what I did. Administer Justice started with $2,000 in a bank account, no other money. I had no idea how in the world we were going to make ends meet. And I can remember very specifically, a little over 20 years ago now, in this little 8 by 10 office that was the first office of Administer Justice, borrowed from a friend of mine who was a real estate agent. And it was terrible. I used to live out in, if you've ever been to a lawyer's office, or the really nice ones. I had really nice offices and really nice stuff. Uh, and it was all gone. And I'm in this little eight by 10 with all kinds of borrowed, everything's borrowed, I haven't, nothing uh, is owned in there. And I just kept hearing all the voices telling me, you're crazy, what in the world are you doing? You're, I mean, you're nuts to do this. And all of my lawyer friends were calling me Bible thumper, preacher crazy, uh, judge friends were saying the same thing. Uh, even my father, who is now a retired pastor at that point, uh, or no, I don't think he had retired yet, but he was questioning because he's got twin grandsons he's concerned about. So he's like, are you sure you really are listening to God? And I really did wonder. I now have the blessing to serve so many vulnerable individuals who have been told by the world that they do not matter. And when you're told by the world that you do not matter or that you're lesser than enough, you can come to believe that. And I came to believe the same thing, that I was crazy. This was too much that God was asking. I was standing over a printer and I could not figure out how to print an envelope. I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but it's just true. I had people who had people who did that. Uh, and so I didn't know how to print an envelope. And I'm so mad, everything's coming together, crashing in. And I just literally shook my fist at God. Have you ever done this? I shook my fist at God and I said, what am I doing here? And friends, I'm not crazy, but God answered. And he said, my will for whatever you do for one of the least of these, you do unto me. And since that day, it has been my joy to invite hundreds, now thousands of volunteers to live on mission for Christ, to bring the gospel and justice into dark places. Again, more than a hundred neighborhoods across the country, uh, serving faithfully, seeing now tens of thousands of lives impacted for the gospel, for Christ, because one reluctant servant stopped to serve someone and then to invite other people into the process. And it is just amazing to see the difference that is made when we empower our vulnerable neighbors with the help of a lawyer, with the hope of God's love, through the home of the church. And it is a blessing beyond measure that I cannot say. Well, I do want to uh, share how you can be a part of the ministry too. 
I want to wrap up kind of the message and what Jesus said when, when he asked the lawyer, which of these three was the neighbor? Which was the one that showed love for neighbor? You'll recognize that the lawyer couldn't even say the Samaritan's name. He couldn't say the Samaritan. He had to say the one that showed mercy. Well, that's Jesus' call is for us to decide. Are we going to be too busy to miss an opportunity? Are we going to be too judgmental and set apart to be of earthly good? Or are we going to take time, resources, whatever it is that God's entrusted to you to advance his kingdom? And his kingdom is a kingdom of justice and righteousness. That's the question. I created a visual years ago that's actually forming the uh, part of my next book. Uh, and it's, it's a visual of justice because I believe that the heart of justice is the cross of Christ. So if they have this visual, they'll pull it up there. That literally, if you look at the word justice, and now you'll never look at justice the same, I hope. That in the center, the very center of the word justice is the cross of Jesus Christ. If we are going to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, we must understand that justice is biblical. It's not political. That justice is the very heart of God found on the, in the cross of Christ. And it is that cross that we are called to pick up daily and follow Christ. And when we follow Christ, we follow Christ to serving vulnerable neighbors. That's what Christ did. He was a friend of prostitutes, of sinners, of tax collectors. He met with the vulnerable, people who needed a doctor, right, the, the, for the sick. And that's what he invites us to do. So if you'd like to just explore some next steps, how can you practically do justice? There are many groups that do justice, but we'd like to explore next steps with you. You could text that to that phone number. Um, I would love it. We'll start a conversation. There's just a, what we call a journey to justice. It's just a way to explore further. We do book studies. We do justice Sundays. We do conferences. We do all, lots of different things to help people understand, to counterbalance what the world is saying about justice, what the world is doing about justice with what God's heart is for justice and how gospel justice makes a difference now and for all of eternity. So it is my hope that you will explore that further. I love how you have been going through how to defend the defenseless. Uh, it is a wonderful series that always continues because that's pursuing the heart of God. In the end, remember, Jesus challenged that lawyer. It will be interesting to me when I get to heaven. Is that lawyer there? I don't know. I don't know how he walked away. He had the opportunity. Will he have taken that opportunity uh, and followed Christ, or will he have missed that opportunity and be separated from him? I don't know. But what I do know is that today you have that opportunity. It starts with the gospel. If you don't know Christ, pray, receive him today. He is inviting you. If you do know Christ, he's inviting you to join him in his kingdom work of justice and righteousness for the poor and vulnerable. So as Jesus said to that lawyer, I say to you, go and do likewise.